If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And uh, if you have the Bible app, you'll find the notes for today's message on the Bible app uh, under events. You go there and you'll find a map of Tasmania. If you've got an iPhone, apparently, you've got a, a map of, of the Australia turns up. Uh, if you've got Android, the map doesn't turn up, I'm told. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, you'll find the, the notes there. I think there's a danger that we can get comfortable with Christianity despite the fact that Christianity calls us to continually think about our lives differently. If you are comfortable with your life, you're probably not reading the Bible regularly. And Today's passage is one of those passages that really challenges us. And in a minute, I'm going to start just with the, the, the dramatic nature of the challenge of verse 13. But just as we come to that, just doesn't hurt to flick back to the start of chapter 12 and just to remind ourselves of what Paul is doing here in chapter 12 of Romans. He starts with this sentence of verse 1 of chapter 12. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. Now, why is he saying that? Well, he's saying that because for the previous 11 chapters, he's been telling us about God's mercy. I have a sense that I'd love to get into the book of Romans because there's so much in it. And I, I think it's, it's really important for us to hear the heart that Paul is trying to communicate. He spent 11 chapters trying to communicate. You could kind of sum it up as saying, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, God loves you. You have a Father in heaven who loves you and has a plan for your life. Now, it's not just about what happens when you die. God has a plan for your life now. That would be one oversimplified way of summing up the first, chapter, the first 11 chapters. But what Paul is saying by saying, in view of God's mercy, he's saying, on the basis of all I've said so far, then put it into practice. And he's, he is saying that this world has a story for you. There is a, a story that the world wants you to believe and to live out. And he directly says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. If your life is feeling comfortable, if you're not feeling challenged, chances are you are conforming to the pattern of this world. Because this world wants to squeeze you into its mould. And it takes active effort for that not to be the case. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, be renewed by the transforming of your mind. And he, and he goes on to say, part of that is understanding the stuff that Emily was saying in communion before. So part of it is understanding that you are not here for yourself. That the big lie at the heart of our world and the lie that Adam and Eve believed was that they wanted to get ahead. They want it to be about them. This world says, make it about you. And what Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy, don't make it about you. In fact, he goes on and he says, in Christ, this is verse 5, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We're part of a big family. This is not just about you. He's calling us to lift our eyes off ourselves, onto Jesus, and then onto each other. And so that brings us to this, I think, 
confronting revolutionary verse, verse 13. And there are four words particularly that sound time in English that are not time in the original Greek. They sound safe, but they're not meant to be safe words. We just don't have any words that are challenging enough in English to make it clear what Paul's trying to say. So in verse 13, he starts by saying, share. Share sounds like a nice thing that you get your three-year-olds to try and do and they're never really quite happy about doing. But uh, the word there, share, means more than just sharing your toys. The word there for share uh, means a deep involvement and participation. It means having people not only, it's not only about what you do, it's actually having people in your heart is what the word share there means. It's a deeper thing than just sharing your toys. It's about having other people in your heart and then doing stuff as a result of that, sharing your life as a result of that is what it says. And who are we to have in our heart and then do stuff as a result of? Again, this is where it gets watered down a bit in the English. It just says the Lord's people. But the word there in the Greek is the hagaion, which means God's holy people, God's set apart people. Some translations have the saints. And one of the things we need to understand, if you are in Christ, you have a new identity. You are set apart. That's what Hagion actually means, God's set apart people, God's holy people. You are not here for your agenda. You are part of God's chosen people. So we are to have the, our brothers and sisters in Christ which means more than our brothers and sisters at Lena Valley, Mornington or the Nepalese congregation. It doesn't mean less than that though. One of the dangers is our world wants to shrink our world so it's just about us and maybe our families. No, what Paul is saying here is have these brothers and sisters, have them in your heart and actively share your life and your resources with them. Not only the brothers and sisters here in this church, but the brothers and sisters around the world. Have a heart big enough, lift your eyes beyond yourself and have a heart for our brothers and sisters who are in need. I love hearing Emily's story, don't you? That she learnt to drive because someone saw she had a need. And that's what the church is meant to be like. We find community at each other's point of need. As you get to know people, you discover we all have needs. And that's where the church is meant to kick into gear. So I believe that this, these little words here, this share with the Lord's people who are in need, this is confronting because what it means is you don't live your life just on the basis of what feels good to you. You organise yourself to have people in your heart and to, in your actions, respond to their needs. It's where I think we've watered down the idea of a church so that it becomes about come and meet my needs. No, the idea of church is we're meant to be a big family looking out for each other's needs. That's challenging, isn't it? Do you, I don't know. How do you find that? Like, I, I think if we can be open to that, when the church is at its best, we are a bunch of brothers and sisters who are in each other's hearts and responding practically through our actions to each other's needs. That's what the church is meant to be. So Paul gives that vision, his picture of church there, and then he says something else really interesting and, again, just as confronting. What does he say? Two words. Again, these words in English sound so watered down. Practice hospitality. We have what we call a hospitality industry, which just means where you go to you know, buy food at a restaurant. or whatever. That is not what he's talking about. First of all, the word there, practice, means 
actively pursuing. Actively pursuing. It's, it doesn't mean just, you know, uh, have a go at that and then give it up. No. It's, it's like actively pursue hospitality. And what does hospitality mean in the Bible? It doesn't mean the hospitality industry, and it doesn't just mean having people over for a meal. What it actually means, the word actually, philozenia, is love strangers. Love strangers. Not only are you to share with the Lord's people who are in there, God's set apart people, you are meant to actively look for strangers. People, what's a stranger? A stranger is someone you don't know yet. You are meant to be actively looking for strangers and the Pillar New Testament commentary says what the New Testament writers mean by that is doing what it takes to move someone from being a stranger to being a guest. Moving someone from being a stranger to being a guest so that you fill your life with guests. I think one of the channels, like I've already admitted the fact, I'm a bit of an introvert. I find it hard work. And I, for me, it can be really nice just to go home and close the door and, you know, well, I, I feel challenged about this. Because I, our task is to lift our eyes. What was really helpful about the prayer time when we asked people to send their prayer requests is just to hear all the very real people who would ordinarily be strangers to us saying, look, I, I need God's help. Our city is full of strangers who need to become guests. Our world is full of strangers who need to become guests. So just with those two things, I think Paul is giving a vision of the church, a vision where we share, where we're actively committed to each other and where we're actively committed. And he actually said where the word practice means actively choosing to spend your time going and looking for strangers and helping them become guests. I just want us to take a moment now. We're going to do a Mentimeter. Just if we took that one verse seriously, what I'd love you to do, what would a church look like where everybody was actively sharing with the Lord's people who are in need and actively looking for strangers? What would, imagine what the church would look like if that's what was happening all the time. Can you imagine that? Well, I'd love you to, let's throw up the Mentimeter. I'd love you to throw up, you, you'll see there's a QR code there, get your phone, and if you're at home, we'd love you to uh, participate in this as well. What we'd love you to do, get your phone out, go to the site where it has there, and, and let's see, if we were to take this one verse seriously, if we were to take that one verse seriously, what would the church look like? What would the church look like? So if you've got your phone, I really encourage you to get it out, use that QR code and, uh, and, and see if you can imagine what that church would look like. If we just took that one verse seriously, really helpful to see these words coming up. What would it look like? See, I think Paul's trying to paint a vision of church that's a bit different to what we often think church is meant to be. Often we think church being a Sunday service. This it seems to be different. It's interesting that inclusive is the most common word we're finding. Welcoming, loving, compassionate. So helpful. We'd look a bit like the early church. So, don't you find it helpful, these words? So this, in my view, this is the Apostle Paul's vision of the church. That he's, and he's saying, in view of God's love, be like this. This is the vision he's wanting us to hear and to see. Be like this. And it's not a, I, part of us know, we all know this is the kind of, this is what we want to be, don't we? We know this is, this is the church we want to be. I, can I encourage you, keep writing those on and towards the end of the sermon, if I remember, we'll come back and have a look and see where we're up to. I, I think the Apostle Paul's saying, in view of God's love, be this. And in case we're wondering about what that means, he keeps going on and he, 
he says something a little inconvenient. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It is so much easier to get annoyed with people who are painful. It's so much easier to write them off or even just to distance yourself from them. Paul here is actually quoting Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 5, says, I tell you, you've heard it said, love your neighbours, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And in Luke, he says, but to those who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. To understand what Paul and what Jesus are saying, we need to understand who Jesus understood himself to be and what he understood himself to doing. be doing. What Jesus is saying is God sends his reign on everybody. He sends his grace on everybody, even the really annoying ones, even the really painful ones. And your task is to emulate God's grace through your actions. It is so much easier to feel justified in writing off your enemies. Not even, like if you're a Christian, you probably wouldn't even be dumb enough to call them your enemies. You would just be calling them the people who are wrong or the people who are theologically misguided uh, or the people who don't understand. We're not dumb enough to call them our enemies because that directly triggers Jesus' challenge. But I want to challenge us in order for us to be the kind of church that we just wrote up on those words, the only way that happens is if you bless those who persecute you. Well, at least that's what it feels like. Because for two things, for, for at least two reasons. One is miscommunication happens all the time and that's going to happen all the time. And the other one is uh, basically we're all sinful and we're all going to hurt each other. The only way for a Christian community to be a healthy Christian community is if we live grace. Is if we live grace. And that's what Paul's calling us to and challenging us to. And I, I, like I said, I don't think, if you feel safe and comfortable in your Christianity, I don't think you're reading the Bible clearly enough. Because that's confronting, isn't it? It's challenging. It's easier just to say, I'm looking for a kind of Christianity that makes me feel good. Well, in order to do that, just don't read your Bible. Invent a, a Jesus that fits into you, what feels good for you. Don't look at the real Jesus, because what you'll find is Jesus loves you profoundly. And he loves you so profoundly, he doesn't want to let you get away with being a self-centered small person. He wants to call you to love people who are painful. That's what Paul's saying. As he says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. That's what love looks like. He then goes on and says, just in case you're wondering what this means, it's not just about, you know, the people who persecute you. He's saying, live your life emotionally impacted by the people around you. Let, live your life emotionally impacted by the people around, around you. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. One of the great challenges for anybody who is a, uh, a works with people is that it's so easy just to keep people at arm's, arm's length, to see people as clients, as numbers. And don't hear me, it is really important to have boundaries. Boundaries are important. Jesus had boundaries. He knew how to say no to people. But it's also important to let people into your heart so that when they are having a good time, you can smile and say, that's fantastic. And when they're hurting, you can feel the pain. That's the picture of this Christianity that Paul is trying to paint. It's also a picture of empathy. 
in the, the book uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee says, you never really know someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes, until you see things from their point of view. Brene Brown says, empathy has no script. There's no right way or wrong way to do it. It's simply listening, holding space, withholding judgment, emotionally connecting and communicating that incredibly healing message. You are not alone. You are not alone. I hate to tell you this. One of the challenges for me as a pastor is I I see our church is full of people who often feel a bit alone. All churches are full of people who often feel a bit alone. Do you know the antidote for that? Isn't to wait till people see you. It's to spend your energy seeing other people. And funnily enough, as we all stop waiting for each other to get our acts together, as we all do the work to love our enemies, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, then the kind of community that Paul has in mind, the kind of community we just named, just give me those words again, as we, as we named, this is the kind of community we said we want to be. That happens as we make choices to actively see others. Paul finishes by saying, live in harmony with each other. We can take them off again, thanks. Live in harmony with each other. And then speaks directly to the disease of our age. Don't be proud. Don't be full of yourself. But be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Any healthy church will have people you like being around and people you don't. Have people you get ego benefit from hanging around and people you don't. And Paul says the measure of a healthy church is that the people of low position are cared for and seen as a priority. It's interesting, Jesus defined a healthy community as one that cared for the kids. Don't you, he said, as they were trying to shoo the kids away, he said, don't you ever shoo these kids away. Because unless you come to the kingdom like a kid, you're, not, you're just not going to get it. Zechariah said in chapter 7, this is what the Lord Almighty said, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. The measure of the health of any church is not how the pastor is going. The measure of the health of any church is how the the weakest, sickest, smallest person is going. The person that people overlook, the person that people find painful, that's the measure of the health of a church. And our task is to be the kind of church where everybody is seen, where everybody's loved. And it doesn't happen accidentally. It's what Paul's saying. This doesn't happen accidentally. You're not accidentally going to create a kind of community where everybody's seen and loved. That only happens when you know deeply and profoundly God's grace. You know you're loved, so you don't have to spend your energy trying to be loved. You can lean into the fact that God loves you and you've got love to share. You've got love to spare. And you can create space for other people. It's not superficial, but wouldn't you like to be part of a church like that? That's the kind of church that changes the world. Where people love each other and love the stranger. Love the people who are outside the church. And who know that Jesus loves them enough that they don't have to be fighting to be seen. But they see other people. 
I'm going to invite the band back up. We're going to uh, sing one last song. As I'm saying, all this is only possible. As Paul starts the whole chapter in saying, in view of God's mercy. Let's pray for God's mercy and pray that we won't settle for being a comfortable church. We won't settle for being proud people full of ourselves. That we will be people who live God's grace and live God's grace in a way that people experience it as grace. Let's pray. Jesus, help. As we look at the words we threw up on the screen, we know we fall short. We know how easy it is to be self-centred, how much our world tells us to be self-centred. Help us look to you. Help us find our life in you. And because we can find our life in you, help us then be people who love. Love our enemies, love the strangers, and love the people who are difficult to love. Help us be the kind of church where everybody is seen and valued. And help that be true for all the churches in Hobart, Jesus, we pray. We need your grace. We can't do this, Holy Spirit. Please come amongst us and do what you need to do to help us be the kind of church your servant Paul was writing about. We ask this in your name. Amen.